We're not against rap. We're not against rappers. But we are against those. Something big about to happen. I hear the beat tapping. We some fly rum and felines rapping on the track. Better yet, grab a gat, cause we hot like. Enzo, doors closed, windows up, cause that's the way we like to ride. Windy City hitting. Check mic 1212. We live, baby. Hey, what's up, Chicago? And welcome back to another episode of Speak Your Mind Radio. <laughs> yeah, um, today I'm going to be talking about a film review called Judas and the Black Messiah, okay? So Judas and the Black Messiah is about the portrayal of the chairman of the Black Panther Party, uh, the Illinois chapter to be exact, that was in Illinois, in Chicago, you feel me? And there was an FBI informative that took them down. Um, this happened like in the late 60s. And like I said, the setting is in Chicago. Now, I know a lot of people out there may be wondering, well, why did they name the the film, the, the um, Judas and the Black Messiah, if they're talking about um, the Black Panther Party? Well, it's like a lot of history behind that. Uh, first and for foremost is the biblical version of Judas uh, portraying Jesus. You know, he killed him. So they said like the same setting with the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton, okay? So Fred Hampton, he was um, alluded by the FBI formative, uh, what's his name, Will O'Neill? No, hold on, let me look at my notes. Okay, his name was, yeah, <laughs> I said Will O'Neill. It's William O'Neill, you feel me? And he's, uh, he's another Black uh, man that uh, had something, to, a lot to do with uh, the the downfall of the Black Panther Party. Period. Now, blame the Black Panther Party. Let me tell you about that. Just in case you know the younger generation don't know, um, they were established in Oakland, California, by two cool college students at the time. You know, uh, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seal. They uh, started like. Uh, a campaigning themselves as a political black power party and they originally started because it was in um uh justice of self-defense because during that time as you can see even now today um the police were killing our black people you know what i'm saying like just for really no reason so they had to gather up organize some type of way to stop these killings within the community. And that's why Chicago is so prevalent in all of this too, because they had something like called the Chicago Seven. And maybe I should not even mention that because I'm still studying myself about these things. But it's, it's just important to say, um, you know, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And here we are in 2021 experience the same tactics and regulations uh, uh, by what the Black Panther Party used to call the pigs, which is the police. And I think we just say white devil, period. <laughs> you know, but it, I mean, it's not a funny situation. It's just funny how, you know, things are uh, a cycle and it, it's still um, happening today. Like the late 60s was not that long ago, period. You know, the ending of slavery was not that long ago, period. So we just have to keep digging further and further back. So let's talk about some of um, the characters in the film, Ooh, okay? <laughs> so now the person that played Fred Hampton was a British actor by the name of Daniel Huyula. And I hope I said his name right. Um, you all gonna remember Daniel from such films as 2017, Get Out. He was a main character in that film. Um, also, he played in, um, the TV series, it was on Netflix, so to speak, uh, Black Mirror. So yeah, he's already had his debuts. Um, like I said, he is a British actor and the the acting was phenomenal because um, you can't even hear his accent underneath um, 
you know, the American accent and everything like that. And it wasn't like no typical American accent. It was just one of those dialects from the 60s that I don't hear a lot of people have today, so to speak. You know, even the people that were quote unquote born in the 60s don't sound like how they used to, you know? So I think he did an amazing job. Um, now let's talk about the portrayal uh, uh, portion of the film. The actor uh, played by, um, his name was, oh Lord. <laughs> his name was um, the FBI informant, uh, William O'Neill. He was played by an American actor, Lakeith Steinfeld. Okay, now I know that name rings a bell as well because he was also in Jordan Peele's uh, Get Out film, you know? Um, yeah, so that's who that person is. And also he played in, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Net, uh, FX's uh, uh, TV series, Atlanta, starting Childish Gambino, okay? So yeah, he had a lot of roles and I'm, I'm um, missing a whole bunch of other roles too, but I just want to refresh your memory on who these actors are. So yeah, so he played the portrayal, uh, the person who portrayed uh, Fred Hampton and he did an uh, excellent job as well now. Uh, Lakeith uh, Steinfeld, he's a very uh, talented uh, actor in everything that he does because he just gets it. He gets the character. He falls deep into it. Um, he knows what he's doing when he gets these certain uh, roles and everything like that. So I really enjoyed his come up story as well, just watching him, you know, different episodes and things of that nature. Okay, so let's talk about um, also, uh, yeah, let's talk about the other. Oh, no. Look, Lakeith Steinfeld, he's also a musician, y'all. He's a rapper. Uh, right. <laughs> if you go on YouTube and look up a song uh, called Vicious, it's on, um, it came out like in 2013. And I just can't believe that he did music. A lot of actors started off doing you know, music and then fell into acting. But that song is really cool because it's just like a real eerie, sinister type song. I mean, it just sounds like that or whatever. I'm not saying it's cool to be that or whatever. I'm just saying like, if you've watched him in other roles, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, he got that. Because he was really playing the hell out of uh, William O'Neill and, um, and um, Black Messiah. So like, dang. But yeah, so that was a good song too. And he also had another song um, out where um, it was kind of like, it's called Do Better. And Do Better is like really like a time traveling experience listening to it. Like it literally takes you back to the era of 1955. Like <laughs> you just gotta listen though. Like, cause it, it really, it really will take you into like a, a zone. You know what I'm saying? Um, the other actors in the movie, Dominique Fishback, y'all. Dominique Fishback is from New York. She's 30 years old. Uh, she looked like a 12 year old queen on screen, okay? No, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. She did a, a fabulous job. Um, she's up for a BAFTA uh, nomination award. And that she was like, you know, for actors, uh, supporting role actresses, and everything like that. And she did a phenomenal job in um, The Black Messiah, too, because she was the uh, apple of, um, <laughs> of Fred Hampton's eye, his character. Um, they fell in love. Um, they had like just made love on screen, like literally without being graphic because it was not graphic. But what I mean by love on screen is um, she was actually the one that got Fred Hampton into sitting down and writing out his thoughts because when he would like, you know, talk to a live crowd, he wouldn't even use a microphone, y'all, because his voice was just that, you know, good. It was projecting across the room to nations of people. And he used to study, I'm talking about Fred Hampton for real, like he used to study Malcolm X's speeches and the love of his life, um, played by Dominique Fishback. Her, her name was Deborah Johnson. 
she um she was the one that set him down and she asked him like after a rally one day she was like do you like poetry or whatever and he was like yeah um da, 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 da. you know they're just vibing at that point she was like well maybe you should consider uh choosing your words wisely because you know everything you say and do is a poetry vibe or whatever and I guess he dug that about her and everything so maybe like throughout the film they would show the progression of their relationship and she actually started writing for him you know being his speech writer is something that he ain't never do or whatever but he liked that and she liked that and they had like such a strong uh, phenomenal vibe and everything like that it was just beautiful you have to watch the love scenes like you know, during this um, this strenuous time of the, I just say, the pigs killing, you know, the Black folk. Now, speaking of the cops killing the Black folk, tell me this. Now, a lot of people that would know bits and pieces about the Black Panther, they probably think like, oh, you know, um, they're real militant, da, 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 da. they're only for Black people, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, they were militant, so to speak, but it had it just militant meaning like a serious undertone, not militant only uh, to deprive our community and our well beings of only in just Black people. Yeah, the foundation is Black people no matter where you go, period. But the thing was, Fred Hampton was so cool with the sh Chicago chapter, you know what I'm saying? He would reach out to, to other groups uh, during that the, the late 60s um, that were in Chicago and were like for different organizations and stuff like that. And so he reached out to the Crowns, you know, they protected um, uh, people like um, Malcolm X and everything like that. And they also did things for the community too. And that's what the Black Panthers were trying to do, uh, things for the community, uh, have food drives for the kids, uh, make sure they had you know, a well-balanced meal. Uh, they were educate, self-educating themselves on our history and our culture and things of that nature. And then also, like I said, people would think it was just like an all Black thing or whatever, but somebody, that was so courageous at the age of 21, such as Fred Hampton, he reached out to more than people of color. He, uh, when I say that, I mean, they, he reached out to what they call the rednecks, you know, those people back then that were like praising the uh, Confederate flag, which means like really racist crap now, or whatever, it wouldn't stand the same as what these other uh, white people believe as, you know, and these people that Fred reached out to considered themselves as white trash and they were even abandoned by their own people just like we you know um uh, abandoned ourselves so to speak the self-identity is so real thank you Nipsey Hustle. you know what I'm saying that man knew who he was period so that's why it's so important because you feel like you're being abandoned by your own people and that's what colorism colorism comes into play I didn't learn about colorism until like you know, when I was an adult and everything like that, and, you know, I felt that as a child and things of that nature. And, I, you know, um, what else? So, yeah, so he reached out to um, groups like that that felt that they had been kicked down and abandoned and bum-brushed also by the pigs, too. And then he had the white folks who felt like, you know, they looked at the white trash. He had them saying, yeah, the pigs, you know? Then he reached out to other groups like the Puerto Ricans or whatever, Puerto Rican groups. They had issues with the police too and everything like that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but uh, he would just reach out to different like groups in Chicago. The Chicago is the number one segregated city because we got like Chinatown, Polish town, Germantown, you know, it's crazy. So I could understand the uh, connection there. Um, let's talk about another actress because I feel like I got off course. No, <laughs> I apologize. But yeah, let's go back to Dominique Fishback. Um, she's also a playwright too. All these actors that are so good at what they do and expanding themselves, they always come from other places and always have other hidden talents. So shout out to Dominique. Um, Dominique Thorne, uh, she played Judy Harmon. Uh, she was a bad motherfucker, okay? 
she girl she was just strong and militant and sharp-minded I loved her I loved the role that she played she was just really good at what she did like seriously and she played in films like um if Bill Street could talk as Sheila Hunt okay uh, I gotta watch that. And she's on, she, I think she's one of the youngest cast members um, in Judas the Black Messiah. I think she's 23 years old. So yeah, shout out to the other Dominique. <laughs> um, let's talk about the person. Um, what is this? I didn't roll something down at all. Oh, oh, let's talk about, yeah, the uh the FBI informatives of uh, William O'Neill's uh uh person that put him up on a uh, game to try to take down Fred Hampton. This guy was played by Jesse Plums and he played in like a movie called Friday Night Lights and he's from Dallas, Texas. He's 33 years old. I just wanted to point him out too because everybody's voice is important. Everybody's role is important as well too. So I pointed him out because he was a good actor in the movie made you feel like, yeah, I'm pig, you know? <laughs> okay, so um. One more actor that really, really, really stood out. All of them were, were great and everything. They were phenomenal. But Ashton Sanders, y'all. Ashton Sanders, he played a character named Jimmy. And he played the hell out of that character. Um, this man, <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know why I should tell you. No, I'm not going to tell you because I want y'all to watch it. But he, he was really engulfed in this character. And... I remember him playing in the Wu-Tang documentary series. Did I say that right? The Wu-Tang series on Netflix as RZA and RZA's trusted him enough to play the role. So he played the hell out of that role too. You know what I'm saying? And so I started looking more and more and more into his story. And I found out that we were really like relatable. You feel me? Because he said the reason why he got into acting is because he was weird a weird child growing up and you know what I'm saying he felt isolated so to speak and what that means is he felt like the other you know and so you say he had no friends and everything like that so I know exactly how he felt bro and he said when he started growing up he started finding bits and pieces of himself because he would just engulf himself into like the, the creative world he said when he was growing up back then it wasn't like cool for a boy to be so creative like cool for a boy to dance and um want to you know probably sing or something understand creative things of that nature but his father was a fashion designer so that's how he got into it or whatever so he's like oh, okay you know ooh, ooh, I like this and this is this is actually my personality because I don't like to sit in one place at one time and I like to experience different things you know what I'm saying so I, I just really related to him I love his story I love who he is oh boom boom and he a model too okay the only man at 28 look that up on google period all right um <laughs> let's go on now um it was something else I wanted to set girl I think I didn't got the movie lower have mercy look I'm trying not to tell you what happened in the movie because it's such a great movie to go see. First of all, it has a lot of um, history in there that not only us Black people should know, but just Americans in general, or if you outside the country, you like American or, you know, whatever, you know, it's something that you should know that's like really cool and important, you know, and the soundtrack to the movie was dope too because of course they were playing like uh, a lot of you know oldies I don't like saying that word but like a lot of classical music I'll say like from the 60s and stuff so it, it just made you feel like you were right there and everything uh soundtracks to movies oh my god they they should just be just as important as they were prevalent in the 90s because that's all we did Joe was watch movies and listen to the music well, you know it has to be a perfect uh combination like a, a perfect vibe and everything like that and it definitely was it. So I don't know. I just like that and everything. I just want to keep on, like, keeping on, you know, with watching different things and listening to different songs and 
uh, watching these actors uh, flourish on the camera because everything I watch, I'd be like putting two and two together and everything like that. I'm like, oh, ba -ba -ba bang, like I got it. Let's get it. <laughs> anyway, so thank you guys for um, listening to me rant, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Speak Your Mind Radio. I hope that you enjoyed uh, this depiction, the depiction of Judas and the Black Messiah today. Um, please visit my YouTube page, like, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to donate to Speak Your Mind Radio. Uh, that's uh, pay.me pal at Speak Your Mind Radio. Thank you. I love you guys. Peace. <laughs>